arriving in Ohio. I had a lot of questions and few answers. We're gonna go west. I guess, I don't know, there aren't any signs here. What really happened in 2004? Were the 2006 elections liable to be derailed the same way? What time zone am I in? Could I speak the language? I needed an important source, like Deep Throat was in Watergate. I didn't have that. But I did find this Ohio tourism video narrated by the guy who played Deep Throat in All the President's Men, Hal Holbrook. Millions of years ago, ancient seas covered all of Ohio. These seas left behind the mineral deposits of coal and petroleum that would fuel the great industrial revolution of the 19th century. Today, if the state of Ohio were its own separate nation, its economy would be the 17th largest in the world. Ohio happens to be at the epicenter of uh, American politics. I think it's a great uh, rural, urban, academic, conservative, Cleveland liberals, heartland conservatives, all in the same mix. Procter & Gamble learned to test their products here very well for a reason. If there's one state that both parties will be focused on, it's Ohio. Public attitudes there often mirror the mood of the entire country. So does that mean if the elections here are fraudulent, they could be fraudulent across the country? I asked Ohioans if they thought their elections were run well. I did hear there were issues in Ohio and or questions about the legitimacy of, you know, the voting machines. There's just different things that were going on, scandals and shenanigans, and I believe it. I still have some unburning uh, issues that won't go away, pertaining particularly to 2004's election. Lots and lots of people were disenfranchised. Oh, bull. I don't believe that. He said black people lost their oh, vote. Thousands of people lost their vote. How do you know? What was proven on TV? I don't remember seeing that. You're kidding me. No, I don't. Huh? <laughs> the lines were extremely long, and it was awful how the people had to stand, older people coming in those scooters, and how they had to wait. I, I was only in line, I think, an hour, like an hour and 10 minutes. There were some irregularities uh, all throughout Mahoning County. At one time, the count was that they had over a million votes that were cast uh, in a county of 270,000. It's obvious that there was a miscalculation. They said it was just a glitch in the computer and that they worked that out. When an elected leader reports something, it is official. But does that make it true? It seems like politicians strive to say official things without having to commit to a truth. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. We did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. Read my lips. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Americans love the idea of truth, justice, the American way, but we know we're being lied to regularly. Saddam Hussein aids and protects terrorists, including members of Al-Qaeda. So if the official story is untrue, then what is truth? I asked some smart people. What is truth? <laughs> what is truth? Wow. What is truth? What do you mean by the question? I failed philosophy in college. <laughs> what is truth? What, what do you mean? Is this a theological question, a metaphysical question, a public policy question? What is truth? I'm one of those, if I could touch it, it's there. It's heavy question, what is truth? I can't answer that question as a vague, abstract matter. It depends on what the evidence points you to. There's different ways of looking at truth, isn't there? You know, and of course, lawyers argue that black is white and white is black, and there's no such thing as gray. The truth is, I didn't know the first thing about Ohio politics. The Republican Party declined to talk to me. I thought they'd be more laid back, since their headquarters are on the corner of high and gay. But since the GOP controls most of the government in Ohio, they have a lot to lose in this election, and little to gain by talking on camera to some dude from LA. 
Rocky Saxby is a prominent Republican attorney in Ohio. His father was attorney general under Presidents Nixon and Ford, and he's represented Ken Blackwell. But he was supporting Ted Strickland for governor, so he would talk to me. The Republican Party in Ohio has a pretty well-oiled political machine, while the Democrats have been sometimes characterized as a fart in a skillet. They're all over the place. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, seemed to answer the phone on the first ring. Can you paint a portrait uh, for me of the corruption in Ohio? Watercolors or acrylics? Uh, mixed media. It seemed like the party chairman didn't take me very seriously either. But the upcoming election was serious business. This is an election that will change our lives. This is the kind of election which will determine the future of the country because if you elect a Democrat in Ohio in 06, you're going to elect a Democrat for president in 08. So do you personally feel the weight of the national issues? I haven't slept in six weeks. The Democratic hopeful to beat Ken Blackwell is U.S. Representative Ted Strickland. Moderating this pivotal race is Ken Blackwell? I don't believe there to be an inherent conflict of interest because of that. Bob Taft, the current governor, was Secretary of State before Ken Blackwell, and Bob Taft oversaw both his re-election as Secretary of State and his election to governor. But maybe Matt Damschroeder isn't the best judge of conflict of interest. He was penalized a month's pay for accepting a $10,000 check in his office from the voting machine maker Diebold in 2004. He insisted it wasn't a bribe, it was a donation to the Franklin County Republican Party, which Dan Schroeder also chaired. Dude, that's a conflict of interest. In theory, I don't see a conflict, um, you know, but in practice, maybe with Mr. Blackwell there is. For Ken Blackwell, they're holding him to a different standard and it just is not fair. His job to oversee the election and he has nothing to gain by messing around with that or he'll, he'll, he'll never be governor. I spoke to another Ohio politician who once ran for governor and was no stranger to scandal himself. I spent time with a woman I shouldn't have, and I paid her with a check. I wish I hadn't done that, and the truth is, I wish no one would ever know. The check was good. That's what that was always got me, is why did people doubt my credit? Back in the day, Jerry Springer and Ken Blackwell were friends in Cincinnati government. So I asked him how he felt about Blackwell's candidacy. The chief election official of the state of Ohio is running for governor, was the campaign chairman for Bush in the presidential race. Am I the only person that sees that maybe that's a little bit unfair? I posed this question of fairness to the citizens of Ohio at the state's most sacred site, a Buckeyes home game. Excuse me, I'm interviewing Buckeyes today. Can I ask you a couple questions? Okay, cool, let's go. Ohioans' love of their number one football team transcends politics, religion, family, and mortality. What if the game was rigged somehow? Well, there's nothing sucks. really but it won't be rigged. do about it. Ohio but State rocks. They won't do that. It happens. Dan, I hope we win. <laughs> as long as it's fixed in your favor, it's that, okay? That's okay. That'd be bad. That'd be bad, yeah. <laughs> the game was what? Rigged. I would be really upset. What do you think would happen? I don't know. Somebody would probably get in some trouble. As long as it's in our favor, who cares? If Ohio State yeah. loses, there will be a riot. We'd, we'd have a rough night, I'm sure. What if the opposing uh, coach was the referee? Get out of here, man. I just said, get out of here. They can't do that, can they? <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Obviously, it wouldn't be fair, but I don't, yeah. that would never happen in society. Yeah. I mean, that's like a, something in a movie script. Woo! Why wouldn't that ever happen in modern society? Some people thought because each county makes its own rules, it's harder to influence this patchwork of random elections. We have 88 counties in this state. Each county has a bipartisan board of elections. You would have to have an awful lot of collusion among each of these different boards of elections and collusion from both Democrats and Republicans working together in every one of Ohio's 88 counties. The Ohio election boards are really, um, they're bipartisan, two and two. So uh, if they have a tie, J. Kenneth Blackwell breaks every vote. So you keep hearing how they're bipartisan, but they're designed to uh, stall on every vote, hence giving every decision to the Secretary of State. So it all depends on how partisan the Secretary of State is. All right, so how partisan is Ken Blackwell as Secretary of State? 
In reviewing the problems surrounding the 2004 election in Ohio, a federal commission issued the Conyers Report that stated, we find that there were massive and unprecedented voter irregularities and anomalies in Ohio. These irregularities were caused by intentional misconduct and illegal behavior, much of it involving Secretary of State J. Kenneth Blackwell. It seemed like the more I looked, the worse Blackwell got. So I asked other Ohioans what kind of moderator Blackwell was in the 2004 election. A few weeks before the election in 2004, he gained a sudden interest in the quality of paper. He issued orders to county election officials that they should reject voter registration forms not printed on uh, white, uncoated paper of not less than 80 pound text weight. Blackwell claimed these requirements were to protect the voter. But it seems like just more bureaucracy to have to get through. This is regular paper. Yeah, 80 okay. Pounds. Okay. This is 80 pound cover. And this is 80 pound. Yeah. It was difficult for me to determine the difference in paper okay. weight. And then neither and standard then nor 80 pound paper seemed particularly heavy. Besides making voter registration confusing, Blackwell made voting locations confusing. In 2004, Blackwell came out with a directive. You must vote in the precinct in which you now live. And if you don't vote there, your vote must not be counted. And then what they did is they systematically switched all the precincts, shuffled them at the last second. So, uh, and then Blackwell admits he didn't have enough time, hence the information on his website was six months old. And some of those people even got to the right room but it was a gymnasium and there were three or four polling precincts in the same room and they ended up at the wrong table. And because of Blackwell's directive, they lost the right to have their vote count. Another suspicious move by Blackwell was that he prevented any oversight for the 2004 election. International uh, observers actually came into Ohio and uh, uh, J. Kenneth Blackwell in a very famous article that was in Cincinnati Inquirer threatened to arrest them if they got within 100 feet of the polls. Doesn't all of this make you wonder just what the hell Ken Blackwell is up to? And anytime you call him into question for his conduct, then he gets very jittery about it and starts screaming and hollering and the like. After the 2004 election, Stephanie Tubbs Jones tried to question Blackwell about the job he did. Secretary Blackwell, it's so kind of you to come before our committee this afternoon and answer questions. Good to see you. I, it was so good to see me that you chose not to shake my hand in the ante room. Is that correct, sir? I, I, cho I chose not to shake your hand. No, that's the uh, question is you chose not to I, shake I my hand not, in the ante room because it was so good to see me. Was I, that correct? I chose not to shake your hand so I see how you comport yourself in this, in this setting. Well, you know what? Watch me, sir. But who in Ohio's one-party rule will challenge Blackwell? The Republican governor convicted of ethics charges? The Republican attorney general? The Republican state auditor? The Republican Supreme Court? The Republican state legislature? Every suggestion indicates that Kim Blackwell is about to pull the same tricks he pulled in 2004. Could Blackwell twist this election in 2006 like he did in 2004 so that he'd be able to control the ultimate swing state in 2008? When someone so partisan and arrogant is running this election, how could you trust that anything would be fair? What is truth? Truth is all that we expect someone to say to tell us what's right and not what's wrong, not to misrepresent. We're going to have uh, an election in November uh, where the count is accurate, uh, the machines are reliable, uh, and uh, uh, the election is fair. In 2006, the Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, Jennifer Brunner, has a very different attitude toward the job. Blackwell has dishonored the office by allowing himself to serve as a chair of a presidential campaign committee and actively taking a campaign role on ballot issues, such as a repeal of the sta uh, state sales tax in 2003. Road to the White House runs through Ohio in 2008. The Secretary of State will be doing such a good job that no one will know her name like Ken Blackwell or Katherine Harris. One of the biggest decisions a Secretary of State can make is about getting the top-of-the-line voting machines of tomorrow. 
On machines, every vote that's cast is counted. The count is mechanically accurate. There have been countless studies, reports, and complaints about the unreliability, inaccuracy, and insecurity of electronic voting machines. And these machines are very hackable, so if a machine is unsupervised for more than a minute, someone could get to it and put in a virus or a hack. This is crazy. You are able to hack into it in 10 seconds. Uh, it takes only a few seconds to insert a computer virus into this voting machine. <laughs> when these votes go into an electronic device, we can't see them being counted, and that's a problem. Voting came to a standstill when people had trouble using the machines. Fraud or intent for fraud aside, there, these systems just don't seem to work well. I vote for Kerry, and what came up was Bush. We've had some testimony here in Cuyahoga County about vote flipping, where you vote for one candidate and it registers for another. It wasn't hard for me to find people who saw electronic voting machines change their votes right before their eyes. It was one of the first times you got to press the, uh, the electronic voting computer machine. When I pressed John Kerry, it went right over to Bush. And so I went back and looked at all the issues. Everything was fine, with the exception of one issue. For the choice of president, it no longer said John Kerry. It had now reverted to a no-vote status. And this is exactly what they were talking about in the media. There's so much controversy and mistrust of Diebold that once I came across their headquarters in the middle of nowhere outside of Canton, Ohio, I was actually scared. I mean, their name is Die Bold. The shiny fortress looked like the Death Star. And when I drove around and peered into their complex, I saw Die Bold's motto, we won't rest. How scary is that? But I was determined to go inside and demand the truth. Since this company does so much with our voting machines, I just wanted to find out some, uh, some basic information about it. Let's turn these off, please. I just wanted uh, some basic information. I can't provide that. Are you the manager? No, I'm not. We have nothing to do with you here. Okay. No, Can you just making... answer just a basic question for me? Possibly. What? How do you pronounce it? Is it Diebold or Diebold? Diebold. 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 Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Have a good day. You too. Well, that settles that. Well, maybe I wasn't able to get much from Diebold, so I met with the director of the Miami County Board of Elections to see one of these machines for myself. I kind of like the paper ballot because you have a paper trail. This is an add-on after the fact, after the design. This is the verified voter paper audit trail. What I dislike about this is it's subject to jamming. They may not fully snap that down. Right. So they have printer interface errors. You can only have between 125 and 165 ballots on the paper trail. You pull it out, and then you start physically counting. They seem like cheap pieces of crap. Open this up, roll it up. So it's kind of a, it's a bulky mechanism. How did these unsophisticated voting machines end up all over Ohio for the 2004 elections? And why are they still being used here in 2006? It's an organization that operates very close to the vest. It's a big company in Ohio, and, uh, and, you know, and they know what they, uh, and they protect their interests. In August 2003, Diebold CEO Wally Odell attended a strategy meeting at President Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas. I would have attended, but my schedule was packed. A week later, Wally invited 100 people to his mansion in Upper Arlington, Ohio for a $1,000 a plate fundraiser, writing that he was committed to helping Ohio deliver its electoral votes to the president next year. The next day, Republican Secretary of State Ken Blackwell authorized Diebold to be one of three electronic voting machines in Ohio's 2004 election in a contract worth $100 million. He was promptly sued by another manufacturer for unfairly favoring Diebold in the bidding process. Ken Blackwell's financial disclosure forms later revealed that he owned 178 shares of stock in Diebold. This is a conflict of interest. In most states, if you're holding somebody's stock 
and you negotiate a unbid contract with them, you go to jail. In Ohio, you apparently get to run for governor. But besides voting machines, Diebold also makes machines that count paper ballots, tabulate votes, and more. And there's all of these other voting machine companies in America, ESNS, Sequoia, Hart InterCivic, who are no better and who are, in many cases, even worse companies. Something I was realizing was that Ohio and many other states have been increasingly farming out the jobs of our elections to private corporations. We have a new gimmick in America. It used to be that, that we, the people, would handle our own elections. We would elect the government, which would then handle elections. Now we've privatized it. We've put it out to bid, just like the contracts in Iraq, okay? And like the contracts in Iraq, where the money goes missing, here the votes seem to go missing. You're not it's supposed to see this. This is a this is a proprietary printout sheet of a private company that's tallying the votes. So as we send out to private companies the tally for the vote, all the precincts go in, and a private company adds it all up. And we hope that our votes influence their decision. Okay, this is uh, Precinct 9D in a county in New Mexico. And there's the Bush Cheney total, there's the Cobb total. I don't know who Perutka is, Darnick and Nader. Where's John? Oh, John Kerry. There's no John, yeah, I remember he ran for president. He's not on, he's not listed, okay? He's been electronically zapped. Not there. So you don't know that, the totals come out and you don't get this sheet. And where did you get it then? Well, we get, that's called investigative reporting. People slip it out the back doors to me. Unfortunately, then, people say I'm courageous. That's not true. It's the people that turn this stuff over to me that are courageous. This privatization and corporatization of secret software that nobody can ever see how they work. Even the people who use the systems, the election officials, they don't have a clue. Voting is not a commercial enterprise. It's not supposed to be a for-profit operation. You can fire your elected officials. You can look at their processes using the Freedom of Information Act. You can't file a Freedom of Information Act on the private contractors. These guys know it. It's completely 100% faith-based voting um, and it's, you know, like waiting every four years for the uh, magical election fairy to come down and tell us who won. And we're all supposed to go, oh, okay. The irregularities that I did observe was a representative from the Triad Company coming into our office without an invitation from us. And they came in free to remove candidates that were not going to be recounted and tore apart our computers and moved hard drives with the ballots on those. Parts were all over the place, on the floor of both computers. So he got everything back together and he said, it's working fine now. Do not turn that computer off, the one that's connected to the tabulator. Don't turn it off, leave it on until the recount. The Board of Elections people do the best job that they can, and they do a very thorough job. The more information you give someone, the better job they can do. As Michael was preparing to leave, Lisa Short's director said to him, I'm really worried about, you know, the recount. Uh, <laughs> what can, you know, she even said something, what can we do to make sure everything comes out right? Is it, is it set? Is everything right? And he said, Yes, he said, it's okay, but if you want to make sure that it's going to come out right to the public, you could put a piece of paper on the wall, for instance, that only the board and the two of you would know the meaning of the piece of paper, which would be like a code. You were just trying to help them so that they wouldn't have to do a full recount of the county. Right. It's much, to try to avoid that. As much information that. as possible is what I'm trying to provide them with. All he did was work on that tabulator and the computers and inform us how to use a cheat sheet. <laughs> and then he left. And they went to 44 counties and did the same thing. Did any of your counties have to do the full recount that you're aware of? No, that I'm aware of. I feel sick about it. I've, I believed in the voting process. I was a part of it. All I wanted was an investigation to see if anything improper was done. But it was never done. We had some sort of a kangaroo court in there for, 
Michael Barbian that was one-sided. He was cleared of everything. We tend sometimes to focus a little too much on voting machines, uh, as if the problem lies there exclusively. You know, the party wants, uh, ideally, to prevent as many people as voting before the fact. Uh, that saves them the trouble of having to, you know, erase or annihilate or alter votes later on. They were called the Texas Strike Force. The people who were bussed in to Ohio by the party and put up uh, on the party's tab, put in hotels, and given these lists of names and so on, and given phone banks, etc., calling up voters the night before the election. This is the Board of Elections. I see here on the computer you got some unpaid parking tickets. Don't show up to vote tomorrow. You will be arrested sent to jail. I mean, I don't mean to alarm you. Go down there with that unpaid child support. They're probably going to walk out in bracelets. Employees of the hotel where they were staying uh, overheard them making these calls and actually alerted the authorities to it because it was clearly uh, an effort to intimidate people out of voting. As we look at the history of African Americans, fear and violence were the biggest problems around voting. We're not talking about dogs and hoses, but mm -hmm. we're talking about confusion and misinformation. And that's the new, new tactic. Following in the footsteps of HAVA, the Ohio Congress passed more new voting laws in House Bill 3, making fair elections even harder. I always try to protect my wallet as soon as I hear someone say election reform. It's always been used to steal your vote. We have a litany of ID requirements that you may now use to identify yourself at the polling locations. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, they're just not necessary because the problem doesn't exist. In conference, I described it as using a sledgehammer or a cannon to swat a fly. And that's, in fact, what these ID requirements are. House Bill 3 said that the um, reason for altering the bill was to root out fraud in the state of Ohio. There has only been four cases of fraud um, in the state of Ohio in the past eight years. Photo ID uh, restrictions at the polling place will most definitely disenfranchise anywhere from 20 to 30 million in this country who don't have a state-issued driver's license, for example. Why don't they have it? Well, because they're elderly. They, don't, they no longer drive. Or they're city dwellers. They're urban folks who don't even have a car. This is a scam. It's not about voter fraud for these people. It's about voter suppression period. There's going to be a lot of confusion because people don't know what type of identification to bring. We have a Secretary of State who has not provided the Boards of Elections with uniform standards for poll worker training, has not provided the Boards of Elections with uniform standards for how you implement voter identification. Groups like the Coalition on Homelessness have made calls to different Boards of Elections around the state and is, is finding varying interpretations of how these laws are going to be implemented county to county. The big, beautiful ID flyer. And, and, and frankly, I really don't like the we ID part of that. How on earth are the poll workers going to figure this out? You can get in and out of the United States of America with a passport, but you cannot use a passport to vote in the, in the state of Ohio. They've got no idea what's going on. They don't know what HB3 did, mostly because, as they said to us, the Secretary of State's giving them no guidance on this. Some of the things that we're learning is we go and visit these boards of elections. If they're confused, <laughs> you know, voters right. are going to be confused, so we need to begin to talk about strategy as well. You need to do massive amounts of voter education. We've got to reinforce it, reinforce it, Absolutely. reinforce it. And we've been doing that, but it doesn't seem to get traction with the press. How are we going to frame it different? I go back to Britney Spears. I know. Like, we all know about Britney Spears. We know she's pregnant. We know she's in a bad marriage. We know all this stuff. And why do we know it? It's not because we want to know it, right? We know all of this because it's <laughs> omnipresent. Even CNN covers this kind of crazy. Yes. So. What we really need to do is have the kind of campaign where it's as, as available and immediate and people are really aware that they need to bring their ID. Can I ask a dumb me? question? No question is dumb. Yeah, dumb question. Suppose everything goes well during the election. That's no a dumb question. That is a dumb question. <laughs> I just tried it. <laughs> Nobody believes that, right? No. The outcome of these rules is clearly voter suppression. Uh, whether or not someone sat at, at a table and said, this is how we're going we're gonna to impact them, um, I don't know. I wasn't there. Truth is, running um, fair elections 
truth is um, finding out um, who best represents your interest, who best represents the community that you're a part of. The fact was is that we had a great election in 2004. Uh, we had uh, uh, a bipartisan system. African Americans turned out in a record number. The fact is, if you want to stop voter suppression, you have to do it yourself. Like this attorney I met in Cleveland, Sabo Chandra. He took Blackwell to court to loosen the voter ID requirements from House Bill 3. And he won. None of us want to be back in court again on any of this stuff. I talked to several reporters yesterday who were just like, well, this is the rule, that is the rule. I just talked to the Secretary of State. And I'm like, you know, what the hell are you talking about? That's not what the order says. Everybody can vote. Uh, who is properly registered, including people who don't have the forms of ID but do have a social security number. When Sabot Chandra successfully sued Ken Blackwell's office to let people vote without photo IDs, the press managed to report the exact opposite of the decision. It's absolutely maddening. I mean, we, we entered into a consent order two nights ago and it appears that whether intentionally or incompetently, they are spreading disinformation. So now we have to get on that and contact the media again, say you're getting this wrong. Some media took us up on it, some didn't. Some went off on their own frolic and started misreporting. What was their source? Ken Blackwell's office. If you win a legal victory against Ken Blackwell to help everybody vote, and then the paper reports it like Ken Blackwell won, what have you accomplished? Vladimir Lenin once said, a lie repeated often enough becomes true. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Lenin. That, that's what I always heard. Besides reporting on voting issues, Bob Vitrakis has gone even further and has taken Ken Blackwell to court numerous times to preserve ballots and challenge the 2004 election. But another part of House Bill 3 says that the public can no longer request a recount, only a candidate. So to keep an eye on the governor's race, Bob became a candidate. I know Ted Strickland. He is a decent man. Who knows if the race is real close. It could be the only time in history, you know, I may have to vote against myself. Even though he is a Green Party candidate, Bob can't even get into the debates. So he and the Libertarian candidate are forced out onto the street to get their message out. How else can we get any, any uh, attention at all? We should be inside there in a civilized debate. Bill Pierce, the Libertarian candidate, hires two guys in chicken suits to represent Ted Strickland and Ken Blackwell for being too chicken to debate him. The chickens were incarcerated. The Blackwell people have blocked the whole street for a long period of time. They're not arrested. I mean, this is really a metaphor for how third parties are treated here. We're excluded from the debate, and it's only our people, the libertarians in this case, that are arrested. Blackwell steals the election. They don't do anything. Purge is a quarter of the, all the voters in Cleveland. They don't do anything. Democracy is a process. Once you realize that, unless you confront those in power in either party that have historically tried to manipulate the system to their advantage, then democracy isn't going to work. Okay, so now that I'm closer to the truth, I have no idea what to do with it. These other lawyer dudes, they're having a hard time with it. They know way more than me. Why do any of us need to do any of this? What kind of oversight can citizens and the media have to uh, keep elections fair and just? You're doing it. I mean, it's fascinating that you're making this film because it ain't being made by Fox News or NBC or ABC or the Petroleum Broadcast System. It's being done independently. All we have is independent media as our protector. I'm the oversight. That's really depressing. How am I supposed to get it all right? What is truth? Truth is probably more than any one of us can grasp, but it's something that we all need to continue to strive for. We can never know truth until maybe a second before you, you die, God flashes you and wow, there it is. But life is a struggle to figure it out. So let me get this straight. 
if the biased officials don't block your registration, they can purge you from the voting rolls or intimidate you or send you to the wrong location uh, or then make you wait in line and then ask for your ID but then confuse you with guidelines because of some stupid laws that give you a provisional ballot that won't count because of the untrained poll worker. Or, if you're lucky, you may then get to vote on an electronic voting machine. And then what if your candidate just concedes before all of this oppression comes out? What's the point? I came here to help keep these elections honest, but I only see more and more ways that it's completely out of my hands. This is an old playbook, John, an old playbook. These people didn't invent it, but they have no qualms about using it. I've never seen any evidence that they have any scruples or would honor the rules. It seems to me that they're capable of anything. I'm sick of feeling helpless and numbing myself to deal with it. I can hang around my hotel room drinking cheap wine and watching bad cable. Or I can do something. We have to take our elections back. But I'm still just one dude, and there's 88 counties, and we've got serious problems. I can't be the oversight for 88 counties at once. But wait. What if there were a bunch of dudes like me out there? I know they're all over Ohio. I've seen them all along the campaign trail. Together, we might stand a chance. But I had to find dudes like me fast. There's only six weeks until the election. And then I got lucky at a Jesse Jackson event about protecting the vote in Ohio. A powerful documentary screen there, American Blackout. It showed ways that African Americans had been deliberately disenfranchised in the 2000 and 2004 elections. The director was there. Ian Anaba. I was a huge fan of Ian's music video for Eminem, Mosh, which came out right before the 2004 election as a call to arms. I got up the nerve, I introduced myself, and I told him what I wanted to do for the 2006 elections. My partner James Rucker and I had, had gone to Ohio to recruit people for an initiative where citizens would come out with their video cameras and volunteer to kind of monitor the polls um, real time. So it was a Jesse Jackson rally. And we had, um, you know, bumped into this guy named John Ennis, who was actually already in the state organizing his own crew of filmmakers. And so we kind of joined forces at that point and decided to just, you know, put everybody under one big banner, which was Video the Vote. In a time of fed up voters and the dawn of YouTube, this was an idea whose time had come. I cut together a promo video with Ian's footage from American Blackout. A week before the election, I uploaded it to YouTube. If the vote is off in Palm Beach County, what about the vote in Iowa? What about the vote in Mississippi? What about the vote in Alabama? One, two, three, four, five. Break down, baby. trying to turn people away, and it's not right. We need to stop all of this. But this election, my name is not on the list, and I had to vote a provisional ballot. The next day, I started getting all these emails. Every minute. YouTube had featured our Video the Vote promo on their homepage. In a day, we had over 100,000 views. Volunteers started pouring in from the response on YouTube. Uh, then the mainstream media picked up. But these aren't your traditional poll monitors. Let's go to CNN's Thelma Gutierrez. She's joining us from Los Web, Angeles. VideoTheVote.org is asking anyone with a video camera to sign up. Voting to Video the Vote's link on the website YouTube. An organization called Video the Vote is stepping up to give frustrated poll workers and voters a popular voice. popular website YouTube, you'll see right on the main page a video that comes across as a call now to Now the arms. founders of a new project called Video the Vote say they're going to fight voting irregularities with cameras. 
Videothevote.org. There's the new edge in citizen journalism. Video the Vote is really going to be the eyes and ears of America on Election Day. I had just hoped for a few dudes in Ohio to help, but in a week, we had over 1,200 volunteers nationwide. They needed to be organized somehow. I had hoped that other video geeks like me would see this and respond. But instead, we were getting tons of people who wanted to help, but they didn't have a video camera, or they didn't know how to edit, or they didn't have a computer, or a car, or high-speed internet, but they still wanted to help somehow. We had to figure out how they could help. So my new friend Melissa from League of Young Voters set up clinics around Ohio for me to help other volunteers. We worked out a system in different cities to best be able to report on election problems and get them uploaded the quickest. I helped organize different teams of shooters and uploaders with dispatchers who were standing by the election protection call center. We will be exporting it from when we capture it at high resolution. It'll go on our server. Our server will then export it to YouTube. I helped people figure out their cameras and ways to label and ID their tapes. The best ways to capture and compress their video, name it, and post it. I focused on helping people set up in the three C's, Columbus, Cincinnati, and Cleveland. I didn't know if any volunteers would show up on election day, or if we'd tape anything helpful. All of the pundits, all of the left-wing, you know, activists had Ohio in Kerry's column. The president was down by nine or 11 points in many of the polls. On election day, you delivered. I got up at 5.30 in the morning to set up with election protection in Columbus. Oh, yeah, here it is, here it is. Love of Life Fellowship. So, let me... Oh, I got an email from Kim Blackwell this morning. And when you vote today, make sure to bring a valid ID. Even if it shows a previous address, and there's already people being turned away in Columbus for not having the current address. There's some people who started to post uh, videos to our account, like long precincts or people trying to uh, repair signs. I think they're out of Ohio. But I just wanted to see if uh, someone was reviewing them and approving them. Yeah, that's all. And they told me that um, since my address is different than what they had listed, and that's what I have on my ID. So I came in and did a provisional ballot. I didn't want to cause a scene. I just didn't want to make any trouble. So there's footage of poll workers saying that they never got the training about how to handle the ballots or IDs. He had his driver's license and he was on the rolls but he didn't have his current address on the driver's license. So they said, well, you're going to have to vote provisionally. If you can provide the last four digits of your social security number, you should be able to vote regular ballot. An older poll worker said, oh no, that's not right, he has to vote provisionally. The County Board of Elections sent out this advisory to all poll workers yes. that they need to let people vote by regular ballot, even if the address. No, they sent it out like this afternoon. Just uh, four machines there. Uh, one of them is broken. We've got this line over here. There are four machines, and only two of them are working. The machine is messed up. Uh, they couldn't let anybody vote on the touchscreen machines because they had no working access cards, and everybody was voting for which one. And they told me the machines was down, and they couldn't get them up. Can I come back this afternoon? They said nothing about no paper ballots. I seem to leave because they're why? He said that they can't be okay, thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Behind the flags. I'll go over there. There you go. All right, you guys going to bail me out? We won't come to that, right? Of course not. All right. You're a soldier of democracy, Dan. All right, here. And they said we could stand up there. Then we stood up there for like maybe about an hour, and they said, we well, you know, he come out, so we're going to be arrested for criminal trespass. but we don't get off the property and come here, across I mean, the street. He said, come on, I'm, I'm an attorney with election protection. I mean, I can tell you 100%, that's completely illegal. So you interviewed someone who saw their vote flip for Blackwell? Yes. yes. Oh, right. Where's that tape? We are short of machines. Well, I've been waiting approximately two hours to vote, and I've just never seen it this bad in my life. <laughs> but the biggest shock of the day was yet to break. Have you seen the headline on CNN and MSNBC? <laughs> what? Breaking news? What? Because while you're doing this, Britney Spears is getting divorced. That is the breaking news. <laughs> That's the October surprise, you guys. Right, exactly. That's, that's gonna like completely derail the election today. Carl Rove, he's a genius. Exactly. Say, man. I, you know, I had no idea they, they, they had this kind of poll. But Kevin Federline wasn't the only loser of the night. ABC, the Associated Press, 
has now presented Ted Strickland as the governor-elect for the state of Ohio. Thank you. Ken Blackwell was out of office, and that made me happy. The thing is about election protection, though, it's nonpartisan, and you're not really supposed to represent one side or the other. So, I just kept it to myself. Despite Blackwell's best efforts to suppress voters, you can only stop so many. An enormous turnout, like the highest midterm turnout in decades. I've called Congressman Strickland and congratulated him and extended my best wishes in the midst of a political setback. To God be the glory. If Blackwell lost, then fair elections won. 2006 was fraught with malfeasance and fraud. Now people say, how could that be? The Democrats did so well. The criterion to use is not how did my party do. The criterion to use is how many people's votes were thrown out, how many people were disenfranchised. Now by that argument, 2006 was a meltdown. It was a disaster. If you talk to Election Defense Alliance, they again looked at the data they were able to get from the exit polls, compared it to the actual results, and they suggest that instead of the 30 or so seats that were gained by the Democrats, it should have been more like 40 or 50. And the margins by which those who won won were much narrower than they were supposed to be. So 2006 was not the clean election, but it does show one thing, that high turnout can overcome the margin of manipulation. Elections are like a 4th of July parade. The community comes together once a year to watch the American process. You can see traditional politicians, as well as some dissenting opinions. It's open to the public but not everyone makes it. You can be a spectator and cheer on the people you like. Or, if you feel strongly enough, you can jump in yourself. In Ohio, I met a lot of people who feel like me. We just can't stand on the sidelines anymore. And as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. If Diebold's motto is, we won't rest, then that should be our motto to reclaim our elections. We won't rest. So what is truth? I can't say I have all the answers. But if a lie repeated often enough makes it true, then the same should be true about truth. It's up to all of us to keep spreading it. The 4th of July used to be the most exciting day of the year for me. But now it's election day. That's the real Independence Day, when we celebrate how our democracy works. And we should all observe it, not just by voting, but by protecting our elections. If democracy isn't free for all, it isn't free for me. I may be just some dude, but these politicians in suits, the old guard running things, they're just some dudes too. I've always been shooting video, so I'm going to do what I do to do my part. What's yours going to be? in a living room Your pipe and slippers set out for you I know you think that it ain't too far But I I hear a call of a lifetime ring Felt the need to get up for it Oh, you cut out the middle man You free from the middle man You got no time for the messenger Got no regard for the thing that you don't That's why you will not survive
I wanna forget how convention fits mm, But can I get out from under it? Can I cut it out of me? Oh, it can't all be wedding cake It can't all be boiled away I try but I can't let go of it Can't let go of it You could learn, but you don't want to know You will not back up an inch of us That's why you will not survive tell you now It may not go over well Oh, and it may not be thought of why No way that I spell it out But you won't hear from the messenger Don't wanna know about something that you don't understand You got no fear of the underdog That's why you will not survive 